So the question essentially was uh, common practice moving into old rows, greenhouses, things like that uh, with dirt floors. So the problem with that is um, whether we want it to or not, nature is still functioning. So if there's dirt in this greenhouse, nature is and still is functioning. And the organisms in the soil are very specific. So um, they operate at specific ranges of oxygen, specific uh, moisture levels, things like that. And so when the conditions in the soil are ideal for their growth, proliferation, and activity, that is what determines what is functioning and performing functions of nature at all times. And so in these old houses, they've been chemically bombed, and so there's residuals of chemicals in the soil that are being pulled up and can be pulled up into the plant, which I understand is and can lead to test failures. Um, and then just the presence of these spores of these organisms because the ground of that greenhouse has been compacted, anaerobic, and full of disease spores for who knows how long. And so it's not, it's not a mountain that we can't overcome. We just have to understand how that system is working. So if we know and can understand that these biological organisms are specialized, we can create the conditions that make it not ideal for them to proliferate or even function or be viable. And it's not uncommon when you're scanning a cover slip of the microscope slide that you see spores of fusarium and alternaria and all these uh, fungal pathogens. They are there naturally in nature in their dormant phase for when conditions are ideal for them to proliferate and perform their function in nature. And so in a extremely healthy, vibrant soil, it's not uncommon to see spores of fusarium cross across the street. And you only become concerned when they're in high populations because it shows that they're making spores. And so if we can change the conditions in that soil, we can, we can put those organisms to sleep, put them into dormant phases, and dispose of them, literally. And that's how nature does it. But we have to change those conditions. And they're not uh, unovercomable. But then you become running into more problems now that you're in a greenhouse with glass and all these things. Um, that's like a foreign language, so I don't want to really... Um, try to break it down. I'll let Jonathan handle that. But then you're running into more problems. And uh, we, we make a joke when people ask us, how do we retrofit these old greenhouses and grow them? And say, you don't. You put PVC hoop houses, you pull tarps, and you go buy an appropriate facility you know, that doesn't have disease and that will be ideal. So one of the things I see most often, because I'm analyzing the soil um, of different growing styles, indoor, outdoor greenhouses, different types of greenhouses, we can see very clearly how those environments are negatively impacting the soil, which is driving pest and disease pressure. And it's coming from the environmental aspect because we're using the inappropriate greenhouse structures and all that business. Um, but really, it, it, you know, we're creating a hostile environment. That hostile environment dictates a hostile soil environment. And then when that happens, the good organisms go to sleep and the bad organisms wake up. You can mitigate those, but then you're still fighting a hostile environment. And we can change the conditions in the soil to be more ideal for vigorous plant growth and um, lower disease pressure, but then you're still fighting environments. And um, we can see that very clearly when we analyze the different groups of plants individually amongst the greenhouse or the space. And you can actually see in the back corner by the wet walls, there's an increase in humidity which is negatively affecting the natural respiration of the moisture in the soil in those pots. When that condition is created in the soil, that selects for organisms that produce nitrates, these anaerobic organisms. Nitrates are fine for um, vegetative and vigorous growth, but as you move into flowering, you have to lower the nitrates and bring in the ammoniacal nitrogen. If you look on the back of any bottle of nutrients, you see this happen with the percentages and the types of nutrients that are happening. So this increased humidity, whether it's, whether it's VPD indoors, you're running high heat, high humidity, it is stifling that soil surface and it's creating these uh, conditions ideal for organisms that produce nitrates. When nitrates exceed 55% of plant sap, you end up with sucking pests, like as a function of math and nature. And so in the back corners of these hostile environments or up against the other end wall with these smaller plants that we don't want growing into the controls and the doors, they're getting the same dosage of water. 
So they're being overwatered every day. They're up against a solid end wall. They're in the shade. They're slow growers. That is the conditions for pest and disease pressure. And so when we, when we individually count all these, these beds or pots or groups of plants, we can look at it and we can see in the corners where the problem is located and address it by either changing environmental conditions and changing a process. Uh, almost everybody is brewing a tea that it selects for disease, biologically speaking. Um, so that creates more populations of pest and disease pressure.